It was all about which countries were owed what and, and continue to hope to have contracts honored post, uh, you know, post whatever we were going to do in Iraq. I don't, I don't think for a minute anybody felt that the Americans were just nasty and wanted to go and kill a bunch of people in the name of Christianity or Judaism. I don't think for a minute the UN thought that. I think that those countries of particular interest, Russia and China and France, had a lot to gain. There were enormous trading deals between these countries and enormous debts. Eight billion to the Russians, five billion to the French, I'm not sure how many billion to the Chinese. Corporate contracts that were signed and ready to go. No, they didn't want the Americans in there for, for monetary reasons. Free the Iraqi people. Nobody cares. They don't really care. It's so uh, sad to say that too, isn't it? Yeah, I originally came here with the uh, attitude where I was going to lay into you about the banality of cable, but uh, yeah. you addressed most of my criticisms. And, uh, <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> and, and also about, um, I mean, being called, uh, you know, a sled on TV. Um, generally, when, you know, somebody attacks somebody else with an ad hominem, um, especially using pejoratives, it's more downgrading to the person who said it than the person that's being attacked, so don't sweat it. All right. Thank um, you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, two more comments and then my question. Um, one, you talked about the lack of coverage in Afghanistan now on the news. I mean, I'm also, I mean, there's other places in the world too, like they had major elec elections in Nigeria, which is a major supplier of oil to the world, and that mm -hmm. hardly got any coverage. And I'd also like to see more coverage of what's happening in Washington, D.C. with all our politicians. You know, they're all out in the West Coast now looking at Scott Peterson. <laughs> and uh, the second comment is, I don't think good journalism and good TV ratings are a contradiction. I just don't think the powers that be that are giving us cable news or TV news or news in general, um, I don't think they've been creative enough in coming up with a way where you can make it both compelling to get people to watch it and informative. And my question is, I mean, a lot of the criticisms of news you brought up today, are these debates being held behind the scenes at MSNBC or? They, they are and they're not. Um, a lot of this falls on deaf ears and a lot of it ends up being office griping more than debate and more than discussion. And, and I have to say, as, as much as I'd like to be committed to the principles of just being more creative in putting better journalism on the air and attracting viewers that way, it's just not happening. I mean, we've had seven years now of this experiment in cable. And do you ever watch the Fox Breakfast Show? Fox, uh, morning, Fox News Morning Show? I got rid of my extended cable. Uh, <laughs> darn. <laughs> Um, I listen to NPR. So. Yeah, the, the Fox morning, morning newscast is, let's say, not Mensa material. Um, <laughs> but it is, it is, for the first time, beating the CBS early show, which is a network broadcast. This has never happened before. So I can't tell you that better journalism, which you would find on the CBS uh, morning show, is going to beat this inane banter on the Fox morning show. And the other example I give to you uh, about that is that I was anchoring a program one afternoon when Ari Flesher was uh, taking the podium for his daily briefing. And it, I can't remember what the topic was at the time, but there was something that was somewhat critical um, to, to American foreign policy. And at the same time, we had been leading up to this one o'clock briefing. There was a trial in Florida of two little boys who killed their father. They were very young. I think they were like eight and ten years old, and they were being tried as adults. Alex Patterson, I want to say, and another, his little brother. Uh, they were on the, one of these kids was on the stand and was being questioned and looked like a little innocent schoolboy on the stand, and we had been wall-to-wall -wall with this coverage. We at MSNBC broke away to cover Ari. We left the live window. Uh, of this child on the, on the stand and instead supplanted it with the, with the picture of Ari and Ari's briefing. And within three minutes, we left Ari and went back to the kid. Now, we were the only network that did that. We were the only network that actually went to Ari. The other two cable news networks just stayed on the kid. And when we got our numbers back the next day, obviously the, in that three-minute period, someone made a phone call to the control room <laughs> and said, get back to Florida. Um, we, we absolutely tanked. When we turned to Ari, everyone turned us off and went, went to whatever station, cable station they could find that was still following that testimony. So, you know, they're both identical pictures in the sense that they're two people talking in front of a microphone. One of them is incredibly important 
and has a stake in all of our security and safety and livelihoods. The other one is just really weird, you know? Just a little kid you can't imagine could kill his parents, and that wins. Please. Yeah, uh, I'd like to uh, echo uh, something the uh, previous question was just asked, and that you stole a little bit of my thunder uh, about uh, so forthrightly admitting uh, you know, the, the, so the right word uh, tilt of uh, cable news. I would like to point out, uh, uh, it seems lately that MSNBC in particular uh, has been moving hard to the right. Uh, you mentioned Michael Savage. Uh, mm -hmm. You could also have mentioned Joe Scarborough, mm -hmm. who now has his own show. Jesse Ventura. And uh, mm -hmm. I missed the first few minutes of your talk, so I apologize if, I, if you did mention it. Um, and also uh, Chris Matthews, who, mm -hmm. uh, whatever his personal politics are, short plays a, a, you know, a pretty hard right winger on, on TV. And uh, then and on the other side, when you have you know, the, the one progressive host uh, you had, namely Phil Donahue, uh, I mean, he, his show got canceled, even though I understand that his ratings were actually higher than Chris Matthews. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, you know, and so, I mean, it's, it's one thing to say Fox has sort of set this trend in motion, but it's getting to the point where I turn to Fox as a moderate alternative to MSNBC. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, so, uh, and, yeah, uh, I have I, to I don't echo that President Weffold's yeah. comment. I kind of doubt that. Yeah, um, so, so, I understand what you're saying, and yeah. that's exactly what yeah. my, I, I, my I, address just, just, just was to actually say what my question was, was just that, mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is this working? I mean, is MSNBC's no. ratings going up as a result of the, no. these hires? No, they're certainly not. It's not working. There's a lot of catch-up that, there's about six years' worth of catch-up that MSNBC is actually trying to execute with this move. Um, it's funny because... Uh, what, what I'm seeing is this, this desperate scramble uh, in any direction that, that might just get you a number or two. And, and who knows if maybe next we'll hire somebody from nakednews.com. <laughs> because if you take your top off on the news, you'll get ratings too. Uh -huh. So when does it become, when is it news and when does it become fun? I mean, we have danced across that line for years now. And we've been, you know, criticized regularly for mixing and blending between entertainment and news. Well, this has just gone off the charts, and nobody seems to even notice. No one's even talking about it being entertaining anymore. They're talking about this being a viable news source. And MSNBC is desperate to try to get the same people watching it that are watching Fox. Um, I don't think Chris Matthews, by the way, is, is a right winger. In fact, I don't know what Chris is. I love him to pieces, but he confuses me to no end. I think Chris does a great job of picking a side that he feels like one day and going with it. And that's one of the things that I love about him. And it's, it also addresses that gentleman's question before. Chris is a very bright man. He's a little encyclopedia of Washington, but his numbers aren't as high as Bill O'Reilly, who's barely worked in Washington. Bill is a very entertaining guy. And he trounces on everyone else's ratings. He's a very entertaining guy, but he's not an expert. And he's sure not Mensa. <laughs> Let's take what, what, one more. One more question. Um, how do you think the corporate ownership of the cable news channels affected coverage in Iraq? And would independent coverage be feasible in a situation like that? Um, I think the corporate ownership, certainly of NBC, uh, allowed this network um, and its subsidiaries to mount an unbelievable broadcast offensive um, against the others. For instance, we had rolling live satellite hookups during combat, meaning as the tanks were rolling, you could see David Bloom not on a herky-jerky satellite phone, but you could see him on satellite. Perfect picture, perfect pitch. I mean, you could hear and see everything uh, as it was happening outside your window. So the money that was spent on that vehicle alone, I think it was upwards of a million dollars just for his vehicle and the electronic setup. That certainly is a huge advantage. The corporate ownership of NBC is the reason that that vehicle and that electronic setup was in place. Uh, the other networks were pretty good doing the same thing. Ted Koppel had, uh, had access with, with satellite truck availability at most of his, uh, most of his outposts. Um, would it change if you were independent? Yeah, you wouldn't have that. You just wouldn't have that kind of access. You wouldn't have that kind of, uh, of, of satellite ability. The, the, the feeds alone, just to, just to hook up and book a feed to a satellite, are in the thousands of dollars per half hour. Uh, the, the expenses that we incur just to bring you those pictures, just to beam things back, even if it's live or just sending tape for air later, that's oftentimes the bulk of our costs of coverage. Um, millions and millions of dollars just in three weeks went out to simple satellite feeds. 
Oh, if you were an independent, you just couldn't do that. I mean, I could talk to you on a, a scratchy satellite phone till I was blue in the face, but even that would cost me about eight bucks a minute. So it's an expensive, uh, it's an expensive venture to try to cover any of these wars. And then don't forget that there's the safety issue. We were all trained in a $5,000 program uh, in how to deal with a, a chemical, nuclear, or biological attack. We were all trained in how to do field dressings, which I ended up being able to use on the side of the highway <laughs> yesterday. Uh, I didn't use the dressings, but I you know, could check for broken bones, et cetera, and, and lucid discussion. But you know, these things are expensive. And to try to assign any kind of security detail to these correspondents and anchors and photographers and audio uh, technicians who are in the field and the engineers, it's a very expensive proposition. Um, you could just you just could not afford it. You couldn't afford it. It's just it's a dangerous, risky job when you're going in alone. Very much like the unilaterals who are outside of the embedded process and not in Baghdad on the other side, they get the fire from both sides, and consequently the deaths among journalists were the the lowest percentage, of course, were those in the embeds. You know, we lost one embed to combat, and we lost the other embed, David Bloom, to combat-related embolism. So uh, it was much safer to be in the embed process and have all that high-tech expensive gear than it was to be out on your own roaming around the desert in a Jeep. Thanks so much, Ashley. Thank you. Great job. Thanks very much, Thanks. everyone. Real Thanks. pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.